think over the course of my life and my career, I'm a pretty open book. So there's really nothing that I'm not going to go hysterical or barge out of here. Like, mm-hmm. how dare you? That I'm could triggered. be great radio. I mean, I could. I could just <laughs> slam the door. But then you're just walking across the hall to right, your office. I'm going to go across the hall now, Andrew. <laughs> I'm so offended. Yeah. To make it, I guess, an awkward working environment for the rest of our careers here at Three Rivers. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Flow Down. This is episode six of a podcast featuring conversations with our students, faculty, and staff. My name is Andrew Marvin. I teach English at Three Rivers, and my guest today is Dr. Rebecca Kitchell. I forgot to ask you what your official title was before oh I do your bio. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> okay. It does not fit on a business card. That's how long it is. So mm-hmm. my official title would be Associate Dean of Student Development and Deputy Title IX Coordinator. I know. I the was deputy, try to do it like just deputy now. dog, very official. Let me try. Becca is our associate dean of student development and our Title IX coordinator. Yes, that's all of it. Yes, that's not that bad. You forgot deputy though, which deputy. is my favorite part. Okay, I'm right. sorry. We'll talk about the deputy part maybe okay. if I remember okay. it. Becca is also an advocate, animal lover, dark coffee snob, a friend, and a pug dog and color pink worshiper becca thank you very much for being on the show i'm so excited to be here thank you very much that's very kind of you to say you are the season finale so there's no (sighs) real pressure that's a lot of pressure i think that um i've had a surprising number of doctors on the show does being a dean give you a degree of confidence does being a dean give me a degree of confidence um that's a great question i I think I'm growing into my confidence. Something happened around 40, I think, that I said, well, you can grow into your confidence or you can just continue to just be. Um, And I think when I got my doctorate and I got the fancy mushroom hat too, which secretly I wear at times in my office, (laughs) if I need to do creative or hard things, There is my Facebook profile picture is me with the mushroom hat on. Um, That gives me that kind of false sense of confidence. You know, kind of putting on that hat reminds me that you've kind of gone as far as you can go in the academic world. And I think as a woman, that's really important for me, too. My mom was two classes away from her master's degree when she got pregnant with me. And it was always her goal for me to go further than she did. And she didn't go back, which is amazing to me. Two classes away, I just think, oh my gosh. But she was a single parent in 1975, so it was hard. And when I got that doctorate, it was like, I sort of did it for both of us. So that's what brings me maybe more pride than confidence. I'm still that timid person on the inside. I'm a great trained extrovert but deep down i'm totally an introvert yes you and me both yes i'm exhausted at the end of the day please don't talk to me please don't look at me my poor spouse is like how was your day i'm like oh please don't speak to me for 10 minutes (laughs) until i get home and get in some non-work clothes yeah i feel the same way and the fact that we are recording at four o'clock p.m on a monday Monday. three weeks out from the end of the semester i I was a little bit worried about myself in terms of how i was going to feel but my class before this was pretty good so i'm right and i have my coffee so good the mushroom hat i feel like is very cool and i'm always a little bit envious of that what is the how does one become a dean like what was your degree in what are classes like are there dean classes yeah that's a great question so my undergraduate degree like yourself was english and i had a minor in communications and women's studies from regis college which was an all women's institution at the time and i was going to teach high school english and then i did my (laughs) student (laughs) teaching and i was like oh no I don't know what I want to do with the rest of my life. I'm not really digging this. And I went to my dean of students office at the time and had, as I describe to my students, the ugly cry, the hysterical, 
snot everywhere, crying. I didn't know how I was going to tell my mom that I didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I was a senior. And she said, you know, you're, you do everything here as a student leader. Orientation. I was a resident assistant. I was on every speaking panel. I gave the tours. And she said, why don't you do this? This And I was like, what is this? And she was kind of waving her hands around, like, do this. And I finally understood student affairs, higher education. And at that time, I think the desperation set in of I wasn't ready to graduate. I loved being in a higher education college environment. I loved helping people. And I went on to Providence College for my master's in guidance and counseling and stayed in higher ed. I've done programming. I've done residential life. I've lived in a residence hall of 200 first year women in what at the time they referred to as uh, the virgin vault of Providence College. 10 floors, 200 first year women, the virgin vault. I was the resident director. Proud moment. And then I stayed, you know, I stayed in student affairs in higher ed. And um, I told myself by 30, you'll get your doctorate. By 40, I started thinking about it again. And I just took a big chance and I went back to Regis and I was the first cohort of their doctoral program. So it it just came like totally full circle, which was really cool for me. That is cool. Yeah. What is the name of the degree? So my doctorate is in educational leadership. And are there dean classes? No. No one ever really teaches you what it's going to be like to be a dean. You Mm. definitely figure out as you go. You make a lot of mistakes. Um, You ask a lot of people for help and assistance and what their thoughts are, what worked for them, what didn't. Um, And you gain a lot of different kinds of experiences with a lot of different people. How I work with faculty, obviously, is very different than how I work with staff, which is very different than how I work with family members. So I like to say there is no one day that's the same. I come into work every day and I don't know what to expect. It could be a fire drill because someone has set the microwave on fire because they put in a granola bar for five minutes, which happened this year. Or it could be a student who really needs to get some additional resources because they're experiencing food insecurity or a student that just wants to drop a class. Um, or struggling with substance use. And that's truly what I love about my job is we are a community college. We work with students in the community. Um, These humans are experiencing amazing, terrible, great things all at once. And to be able to have an impact on that is like the coolest job. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that so you went back to Regis for the PhD. I did. EDD, actually. EDD. I'm sorry. Yep. Okay. So EDD. Yep. And then um, and that was an educational leadership. How do we go from graduating with that to Three Rivers? Because you've been here a while now, but it's... Can you believe not even two years? Not even two years. I it know. feels like longer. I know. So I... Um, Before coming to Three Rivers, I was at Clark University. What's interesting is that I have always worked at four-year private colleges or universities that have residence halls on campus. So, you know, students that live there. And at some point I said, I want to go to a community college where I can be more impactful. Um, I was working with students that really had a lot more opportunities because of their um, backgrounds and their, you know, family incomes, they had a lot more opportunities. And it at times became a little monotonous for me. I wasn't really getting to work with students who needed the additional support. And that's the part of my job that I love the most. And I said, at a community college, I can really take my personal experience because I was one of those students, right? I was that kid that came from a single family household whose dad left when I was six weeks old. My family had a lot of mental health issues. My dad had substance use issues. We grew up poor and education was something that I knew I had to work for. And if it wasn't for my dean, I probably wouldn't have had the opportunities that I did And I think that that somehow imprinted on me that that was my job, 
because that was the student that I was. And someone recognized that and took me under their wing and mentioned things like scholarships and um, assistantships and all the things that I had no idea what a FAFSA was. And I remember thinking, this person, it's her job to care about me. She gets paid to care about me. But it became so much more than that. And that's what truly led me down this path that now I get paid to do what I love every day, what means the most to me. And I get the most joy. Um, Do we have bad days? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. But we have like amazingly fun days too, where I can go home and be like, you'll never believe what happened. Um, And that's what makes it all worthwhile. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. When you say your relationship to your Dean, because I think this is not a an evaluation of you because you're incredibly student facing. But I think for a lot of students and even for me, because I don't think I really had a relationship with my Dean Mm -hmm. because the Dean is sort of like up here, right? Kind of doing important stuff. I'm sure lots of meetings and that kind of thing. It sounds like you were able to cultivate a a more of a personal relationship to your Dean. Was that unique? Or was that a a characteristic of that person? Or how did that come about? I think a little bit of both. Um, I think I was a little bit of a nudge because I knew I needed a little extra help. I remember my mom saying to me, if you want to go to Regis, you better learn how to cry because we can't afford Regis. So you better learn how to cry in the financial aid office. That was her advice to me. Okay. So... If anyone knows me, the funny thing is I can cry when I'm happy. I can cry when I'm mad. I can cry when I'm sad. So I was like, mom, I've got this. Like, I'm good to go. I am heading to Regis. And I just sort of put my play, put myself into places where I knew I could get extra help. And I think that was also, I wasn't getting that at home, right? It was, I just sort of was there, right? There weren't people really looking out for me. And so this was my chance to create a new life for myself and that meant finding and to this day my chosen family right who are in who's my tribe who are the people in my tribe and she also and what I like to do is put myself into places where the students are so it it would be really easy for me to sit in my office and see 131 and expect that because of this title students should come see me they should know what I do lots of times students don't know what a dean is they they consider me either a principal a guidance counselor or the mean dean that's what I've also been called to like you're going to get me in trouble because of my title nine work so I have to break down a lot of those kind of preconceived notions on what a dean does and create opportunities to build rapport with students. So that's why we do a lot of the programming and the tabling and just walking around during the day or having a Keurig in my office. That has been an easy thing. Students just come in. They want a hot beverage. Don't we all? Like, Don't we all just want someone to offer us just a cup of tea or a cup of cocoa when we're having a bad day? And so those types of things... I remember those were the special moments for me. And those are things that somehow stuck in my brain of when I'm, you know, a dean, I'm going to remember to have pictures of students in my office. I remember when I went into my dean of students office close to graduation, and she always used to frame pictures of students and have them in her office. And I remember thinking, I want I want a picture of myself. Like I want that moment. And before I graduated, she had a picture of us in her office with, you know, all the other students. And I thought someday I'm going to have an office that has student artwork and pictures in my office because that meant so much to me. So it's little things like that about creating a sense of belonging on our campus. Where do you fit? Where do you belong? And I think for a lot of our students, especially in the community college system, they never saw themselves at a college. So to be able to see yourself visibly here um, and to know that you belong and, and you have a place here and you've made a difference, that to me is 
you know you've arrived. You know you you deserve to be here. Amazing. Definitely more than... Because you think dean, you might think administrator, but so much sure. more than administration. And that's... Yeah. And I mean, yes. Do I have to go to meetings and take notes and do reports and run statistics and, you know, do budgets? Absolutely. Do I love doing those things as much as I love creating experiences for students? I would say I would do that over a budget report any day. One would hope, yeah. But, I mean, there are some people that, you know, statistics is their jam. True. Not me, but you still have to do it. So I would say if anyone's thinking about, you know, higher education or administration, sure, you have to know how to do those things. You want to be able to walk into a room and demonstrate competency. Um, I think especially as a woman in higher education, as a leader in higher education, you need to be able to demonstrate, unfortunately, still to this day, you know, your worth, that you have the competencies, the experience, the background to be able to um, hold your own, to be able to gain the respect of everyone at the table, because getting to the table is hard. So was Three Rivers your first uh community college exposure yes okay yeah yeah so how has it is there something about the community because i know you uh you aspired you wanted Mm -hmm. you were drawn to the community college Mm -hmm. environment once you got here was there something that you did not expect yes so my background as i said is very traditional so i would say like 18 to 22 year olds you know living on a campus um you could go to the dining hall and there'd be students there. You'd go into a residence hall to do a program. You had a captive audience. Coming here, you really have to throw all of the concepts of a traditional college student away. I work with students between 18 and 64. So that is a wide range. So what works for one student is not going to work for another student. And that's what makes it fun. So you could say to a student, oh, did you see this post on Instagram? I may be able to say that to my 18-year-old, 21-year-old student. To my 64-year-old student, maybe I need to print a flyer and make sure I hand it to them so they have access. Not to say that our older friends aren't tech savvy, but you have to know your audience. And our audience is so diverse. We have students that come to class once a week. All of their other classes are online. So maybe they're not going to come to campus to see a flyer. Maybe I need to do some open door hours online. So I had to think in new and creative ways, which was fun for me. Because at that point in my career, I'd been doing this for like 20 years. So it gets sort of repetitious, right? You do the same programs over and over in the same way. Coming here was like, you need to rethink everything. And that's what made it really fun. Right. The diversity of the community college, I think, is something that has probably been expressed on all of the episodes of the show yeah, so far, yeah. from student perspective to faculty perspective to, to staff perspectives. You mentioned uh, that one of your priorities here and elsewhere is to create communities of care. Mm-hmm. And you are on uh, our care team. Right. What a great team, right? We it's just a great care team. about people. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell everybody what the care team is and what it does? Sure. So within our CT college system, we have um, a care referral. So the care referral form is um, a referral form that um, community members, so faculty, staff, or students, or anyone else outside of the community, it could be a mom or dad, it could be a mentor can go on our website and do a care referral. And by referring someone to the care team, what you're saying is one of your students is in need of assistance. And that could be for a multitude of reasons. It could be basic needs, food, housing, shelter. It could be the student is struggling academically. It could be a mental health concern. It could be um, physical um, abuse at home, a multitude of reasons. So someone is saying a trained person needs to reach out to this person and offer assistance. So my one of my main jobs on campus is to review all of those care referrals, and they come in every day. We're getting referrals from students for other students, students for themselves, Um, faculty and staff for a student. And I review those care referrals and then we review them as a team 
and talk about how we can triage. What services can we connect that student to? Um, who would be the best person to make that connection? How have we tried to reach out to that student in the past? Maybe we've emailed and the student has never responded, so now we need to call. And we just try to make sure that the student has that holistic response. So there's multiple people or multiple resources being offered to that student. And of course, the student has every right to say, no, thanks. You know, I feel like I'm doing okay. And that is fine. But we also want to make sure that a student who may not know about those resources has an opportunity to connect. Because our main goal is making sure that there's no impediments to that student's education, that we're breaking down any barriers that may exist. So for example, today I met with um, a student who's going to be an incoming student for this fall. And um, a case manager reached out to me from Stonington. Um, This is a high school graduate who's been um, in, you know, DCF under the care of DCF for quite a few years, now graduating, and will be a member of our community. So that case manager wants to make sure there's this seamless handoff, that the student just doesn't come here and get lost. So we had a long conversation this morning about, you know, where can we get food resources? How does the student sign up for SNAP? Do you have therapy on campus that the student could take advantage of because their therapist is in Stonington and they're not going to be able to get there? So I work with students one-on-one or faculty, staff, other students that may be reaching out to gain insight on how to help their friend. So I'll meet with anyone and connect them to the right resources and then make sure we have a documented action plan in place and that folks are actually doing what they're supposed to do. So for example, if you're telling me one of the students in your English class hasn't been to class in three weeks and I reach out to the student and then the student says, Um, I'd like to meet with, you know, Professor Marvin and talk about what I may be able to do moving forward, that then I can follow back up with you and create that relationship or that communication. Right. I've been on a member of the Three Rivers community for 10 or 12 years now. And so I feel like I know as much as one can know the the adversity that Mm -hmm. our students face and overcome on a regular basis. But being on the care team, I feel like has given me an even wider yeah, perspective yeah. about the challenges because you see just all kinds of stuff mm-hmm. uh, coming through on those referrals. I don't know about you, but sometimes I go home and I think, why did I why did I say yesterday was a bad day? You know, like I don't get as flustered sometimes when I hear about some of the our students and what they're going through and also what they're able to achieve. Sometimes I'm like, oh, you really... Today was an okay day, despite, all right, Dunks didn't get your coffee right. You don't have it that bad, Kitchell. Like, pull it together. (laughs) Yeah, perspective is the whole game (laughs) for me. Right, right. How, you kind of just addressed it, I think, but because you put yourself out there so regularly and just in the context of reading those care referrals, because you're, we meet every two weeks, Mm -hmm. but you must be reviewing those daily, you said, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you, and maybe this isn't a challenge at all, in which case you can teach us but how do you do you have to take care of yourself Mm -hmm. to protect yourself from not absorbing all of those things that could be interpreted as sad or challenging or difficult things to expose yourself to yeah i think you know there'll never be a point i hope in my career where i don't read those reports and have some kind of reaction um i think that would probably be the day if i've grown that callous and emotionless i should retire. Um, But I definitely have learned techniques and strategies to not bring it home to me. So I'll be very open and honest. I've been in therapy many years because of the work I do and my upbringing. And I remember my therapist saying, you know, you can't, if you go home with all this stuff, and then you tell your partner about all this stuff, you're then traumatizing your partner. And that re-traumatization can create this cycle. So one of the the things I do is at the end of the day, I make sure to kind of, I literally do like a sweeping of my arms. And it's, to me, it's like a symbolic, I kind of brush off, right? I'm not physically taking home with me 
the stuff. And when I leave, I listen to a podcast or I roll the window down or I drive by the beach or something to that is mine that I can be, you know, I can own. That's my little thing. Um, I had a colleague at another institution who would literally change her clothes before she went home because to her it was I'm taking the work clothes off and I'm putting on my at home clothes. So I'm not walking into the house with all of the stuff that we carry. So for me, that has worked really well because I want to make sure that my work life is healthy, but my home life is healthy too. And, you know, I love my spouse to death, but he's a draftsman, right? So he, as he says, draws pictures on a computer. So sometimes when I go home and I'm like, oh, this, this happened, this big thing happened. And he's like, oh my God, like, I don't want to know about those things. I just want to draw pictures on a computer. So I want to make sure that I'm doing what I love and that I can do it really well, but also maybe folks who aren't equipped or don't want to, right? There are some, sometimes where some of the things we work on, it's really triggering to other people. So I want to make sure I have strategies in place to protect them and also to really protect myself too. Yeah. I love that ritual of brushing the arms. Yeah. Because I, whenever I do it in front of my students too, because right before I start teaching, it's like as I'm inhaling to say my good morning or, or whatever it is, my first words to the class, I do like a, like a trunk twist. Okay. Where I kind of like, you know, get pumped up a little bit. Yep. Yep. But it is a, a cue to activate the, like you said, the, Absolutely. W- the rehearsed extrovert yep. version of myself to turn that on so that the, regardless of what I'm, carrying as I walk into the classroom Mm -hmm. with, you know, sometimes you just, you don't feel like you want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Or whatever happened moments ago or last night or yesterday, but you can't let that affect the class. And so doing that, that ritual, that physical movement, Mm -hmm. even though it's, it seems meaningless, but it really has a profound impact, I think, in getting your, your head in the right space. Yeah. You have to find your thing. You know, some people at the end of the day, it's a shower, you know, you're literally washing away kind of all your troubles of the day. Um, my house, we we call it uh, no hard clothes. So at the end of the day, when my husband and I come home, what we're wearing now, our business attire, are, are what we call hard clothes. So within 10 minutes, the rule is no hard clothes. So you have to put on you know, your sweats or your pajama bottoms. I have this hoodie that I've had probably 20 years. And that's when we're in that space of, okay, now it's the two of us and we're home and we can sort of shed the uniform, if you will, and just be us. And um, I also think it's really important. I've I used to take a lot of work home with me. Now, if I do have a project, I'll stay late here to work on it and I won't take it home because home has become sort of a sanctuary of Sure. Do we work from home once in a while? Absolutely. I work remotely one day a week, but that's a scheduled time. If I'm taking homework all of the time, it also signals to my partner that somehow, you know, I'm not making the time or making a priority. And that became really important to me. And I thought a lot about it after we lost Alicia, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, Life is so short. And do you want to be known as, you know, someone stands up, hopefully, many, many, many years from now, I would hate for them to stand up and say, Rebecca was a really hard worker. That just sounds like, oh, right. Is that something I'm proud of? Sure. But I don't want that to be everything that everyone knows about me. She worked really, she took work home with her. Oh, yuck. (laughs) Yeah, I feel the same way in terms of because as faculty, our our schedules are flexible. Yeah. Right. And there is a lot of taking stuff home and try as I might. I seem to always have something to grade, you know, the weekend or at night. But I'm the same way with the no hard clothes thing. And sometimes I will even keep because this is my uniform, such as it is. uh, I will even not get changed if I need to go home, but I still have papers to grade. Sometimes I will keep the uniform on to just sort of stay. So you don't get too comfy. Yeah, so you don't yeah. get too comfy because yeah. then having to go, quote, back to work after dinner. Yeah. Oh, my god! It's just ugh. brutal. It's tough. Yeah. 
one more question about the communities of care. Sure. Obviously, as the dean, <laughs> <laughs> as the dean, you have um, a degree of, I don't mean the word power in a, mm-hmm. in a nefarious way, but you sure. have a degree of power to like put on events and mm-hmm. address things on a larger scale. How do you think those of us that are not deans as individuals, what can we do on maybe a much smaller but still impactful scale to help yeah. preserve our community of care? I would say the easiest thing to do is to just, first and foremost, know your students' names and know their their chosen name as well. So as we know, some of our students... Um, may decide on a new name that redefines who they are, and that is their chosen name. Know students' names, call them by name, greet them. I often hear from students that you're the first person today that said hello to me, and maybe it's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that just seems so sad to me that a student can feel invisible. So having that visibility in a classroom where... Maybe the student was absent on Monday and you see them on Wednesday and you say, hey, I missed you on Monday. That shows you actually noticed that they weren't there, that somehow they didn't contribute to the normal curriculum, the normal classroom experience. And those things, I think, create communities of care in the classroom. When I hear about, oh, the student stopped coming to class maybe in September, and you're not reporting it until December. I'm like, oh my God, like I missed so much time that I could have maybe helped to find that student and retain them or turn the situation around. So I would say know your students, know their their little idiosyncrasies, how, you know, what maybe they come late, a few minutes late, but if they're not coming at all, something's changed ask for help, you know, reach out to myself or just send an email to the student that says, hey, we've missed you. Where are you? Can I help? That to me is a huge thing. We're not asking folks to be mental health clinicians. I'm not. I don't, you know, expect people to be triaging a treatment plan or diagnosing students. But I do want folks to be able to know their students and just care enough to make sure they're okay. I'm a big proponent of the name things as well. Yeah. It just seems like, so. I mean, I am, to be fair, fortunate to teach classes that are only 22, 24 students mm-hmm. large. You know, it's not like big lecture hall stuff, but I do try to have everybody's name memorized by the end of the first day, which I'm pretty good wow. at from years of experience. Good for you. You just use it over and over and over again. Uh, at the first day in of an class. awkward way, Andrew, would you like a pencil, Andrew? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the uh, on the first day, I always do. It's kind of like, um, you know, you hear stand up comedians do crowd work where mm-hmm, they sort of mm-hmm. just joke back and forth. Sure. The audience, I try to do that on the first day. And during that interaction of two or five minutes talking to the person one on one, it usually helps to sort of ingrain the name. And also something interesting. So yes. it's like your Andrew with the yellow umbrella. Right. And especially if students sit in the same seat, I'm like, please sit in the same seat because I can (laughs) memorize it that way. But good for you. The older I get, man, names are tough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And humanizes them too, right right, right from the get go. Right. You mentioned that uh, your own experience with therapy. I also Mm -hmm. have my own experience relatively, relatively recent, but something Mm -hmm. I've really benefited from and enjoyed. But you particularly mentioned equine therapy. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, So I probably some would say I love animals more than people at times. And my stepdaughter grew up with horses. So she rode Um, and showed horses growing up. And her and her grandmother always had that bond. So at the holidays, they would always talk about their riding experience and all of the terminology that went around, you know, horses, and I didn't really understand it. And at some point, um, I was feeling a little bit lost in therapy was working, talk therapy was working, but I needed something else. And my therapist recommended um, High Hopes, which is in Old Lyme, Connecticut. High Hopes has been around for 50 years. 
and it is a community comprised of um, all volunteers. So everyone there is a volunteer. Um, they are grant funded um, or sourced through different fundraising efforts. So the staff, the professional staff there is all paid through grants and fundraising. And they are an equine facility that works with um, special needs populations, um, especially folks on the spectrum, folks who have experienced trauma. So our um, firefighters, police, EMTs, um, they also work with people around trauma. And that's where my piece fit in that I'd experienced um, some pretty significant trauma and was looking for a way to better understand that trauma and heal in a in a really healthy way. So I got involved in a program called Healing Hearts, which was a small group of women. And the first 45 minutes of this program was yoga. And I had been doing yoga a little bit in the privacy of my own home, never in front of people, which scared the crap out of me. Um, and I'm also incredibly accident prone and very, very clumsy. So I was very scared to go in front of a group and do yoga. So that was number one, like put on yoga pants, go in front of these people and do yoga and not fall down. And then the second part, so it was 45 minutes of yoga and then 45 minutes with the horses and all of their horses are either rescues or retired. So retired show horses, retired carriage horses, which I didn't even know. It's very Bridgerton, you know, carriage horses. They have uh, ponies that have been, you know, with the circus or these traveling carnivals, and now they're retired and they do this specialized work. And it was grooming horses. It was learning how to walk with them and lead them. And I realized just how in tune with people's emotions horses are. And here's these like big, scary, like they're huge, yeah. right? And I remember the first time I went, I was talking to the lead and she said, when you approach this particular horse, just be mindful. He doesn't have, he doesn't deal with any BS. And I thought like, like, oh, it's a horse. Come on. Like, you know, and I walked up to the horse and she said, you need to breathe. You need to inhale and exhale before you approach a horse because they are so in tune with breathing that they hear you release that breath and they will know that you're approaching in a mindful way. So I was very skeptical. I'm a very skeptical person, probably because of the work that I do. I'm like, okay, okay, sure. So I did the breathing, but I did it, you know, in a very skeptical way. And then I approached this horse <laughs> and the horse literally like head butted me in the chest. Oh like, gosh. and I was like, Oh, okay. I need to release kind of my beliefs on this and really just get into it. And I've actually been doing it. It'll almost be a year now on Mondays I go. So I leave here and I go do yoga and I spend time with the horses and I volunteer in the barn now. And my friend's like, you, so you literally shovel horse crap for fun. I'm like, yep, yep, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's just been incredibly healing. So I would say if anyone has time or wants to learn more about horses or equine therapy, High Hopes is great. And it's local. They, again, do so much for our community. And it's sort of this little hidden gem that people don't really know about. Um, their grounds are huge. You can go and just sit on the grounds. You can walk around, you can see the horses. And it just has been a gift that I've been able to give myself, which has been so cool. I was going to say so cool. Yeah. And I don't, you know, everyone's like, oh, do you ride them? I'm like, no. And they're like, well, what do you do? I'm like, I brush them. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so silly, but there's something so like cathartic and healing about it. Yeah. Um, and they recognize you when you come in and they're like excited to see you. And it sounds so silly, but it's, it forces me right at the end of a Monday, which Mondays are tough. It forces me at the end of the day to leave on time, which is important. Go do something for myself when it would be really easy to just drive home and plug into Netflix. 
but I do this and it has been really great. And it's something now, you know, just going to volunteer, you, you meet other like-minded people, other people that are on a journey, you know, for healing or have experienced similar trauma. And it just has become something that's routine for me now that's been really good. So that's my tip for people. If they want to check out High Hopes and Old Lime, amazing, amazing people and amazing horses. It sounds amazing. I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with horses. Neither but, did I. <laughs> <laughs> but I have uh, one of my favorite Cormac McCarthy novels is All the Pretty Horses. And there is a lot of, in that book, there is a lot of um, symbiotic sounds too scientific, but like a spiritual connection mm-hmm. between the human characters and how they yeah. you know how they talk he, McCarthy's prose is just so like godlike in its way but kind of talking about he he talked to the horse and the the connection just seems really profound and they're very they just i don't know they're really just cool creatures that i don't know it's very interesting you know they know they have a job to do right and at the end of the day when their job is done they also you know, when we release them into their pens, they'll like run and jump and and just be free and they don't care, you know, how silly or big they are and how goofy they look. And to me, that's my goal, right? I don't care how silly or goofy or dumb I look, but I'm experiencing happiness or joy and like so much to the effect of like, I'm literally showing it off to the world Mm -hmm. and hopefully helping other people to feel that joy too. Yes. And that reminds me of the yoga component as well, because so much of the yoga component, like you expressed, is the fear of doing it among other people. <laughs> yeah. And as my yoga teacher says, you got to stay on your own mat. And yes, so the practices, my yoga teacher, see, they it, read the book. They yeah, did stay read on the book, your own yeah. mat. Yeah. If you fall not, down, get back up. Right. Not compare yourself like, oh, that person's so much better yes. than I am or whatever. Uh, yeah. My yoga teacher will invite us to different poses. I don't know if, if you're so I invite you if mm-hmm. if plow is in your your practice. Now, plow is like my legs are over my head. Yeah. And at this point, I've been doing it long enough. I'm like, OK, Heidi, no, no, thank you. No, thank you to plow. Yes. And we, you know, she'll just laugh. But um I'm a lot better than I was. I'm not by any stretch a yogi master, but I don't care as much about how I look. Right. Which is, for me, a huge deal because I like to be a perfectionist. Like growing up, that was really important. That's how I got like attention, right? It was, I got the good grades and I did everything right. And now to just be on my mat and do what I can do and know what I can't do, but still try. It's cool. Yeah, definitely. And it is, uh, it is about staying on your own mat, but I think also part of the benefit of the practice is that you are all staying on your own mat together. And so you are breathing together in that way. Yep. You are a big, uh, Schitt's Creek Ted Lasso fan. Yes. What is it about? I've seen both. Okay. What is it about those programs that you feel like, has made them so uh, such cultural touchstones mm-hmm. at this point in time. So I'm not finished with, with Ted Lasso. Right now I'm on season two and I'm on the episode, the Christmas episode, where all of the players go to um, the house for the holidays and then um, Ted and the owner are delivering Christmas presents in the community. Um, and we watched that last night and I said to Rob, my partner, um, I just don't want this to end. And after that episode, he's like, do you want to watch another? And I said, no, (laughs) he's like, well, that was pretty definite. I said, because I'm savoring this as I watch more, like I could easily binge it and then it's going to be over. Ted Lasso has been like, it's so silly. I'm, you know, I'm an, English major I'm supposed to be reading right but that's the kind of energy right like to be a coach and to be that connected to the players that's how I think my job is here you know I'm a coach I'm connected to my students I need to know their stories I need to know you know give them a place to call home be a part of a team and then Schitt's Creek is just it's everything that 
you know, every character in that episode could have been one of our students. It's, we are a community and Schitt's Creek was a community for good, for bad, for indifferent. And, um, it teaches you so much about acceptance and also about change as uncomfortable as that is. We, we need to learn and we need to change and we need to throw away our old kind of perceptions of things. And I don't think I've ever laughed so hard as Schitt's Creek. Um, my husband, and I have matching Schitt's Creek pajamas. My t-shirt says um, about Bob Cratchit when the dad was wearing the long like nightgown night shirt. And we were just so sad when it ended. It was like, now what? <laughs> now what are we supposed to do? So Ted Lasso has been a new, really cool find for us. Yeah. And they be- they kind of become your friends. Yes. And don't then, you wish you re- like yeah, could then, go to that bar and hang out and have a beer and just chill out with those people? Yeah. And with Ted in particular, the thing that's... Because we've watched the whole thing. And with Ted in particular, what sticks with me is that it's not just like he's like the most awesome coach, but he's also really vulnerable. And mm-hmm. like, so there are... You know, scenes where he has spoilers for Ted Lasso, but has panic attacks. Yes. At a yep. time when I had recently started having panic attacks yeah. and seeing that depicted was very comforting, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, in a way. And so that's what I remember from him is just, it's not that he's just like the, the perfect coach and totally awesome, right. but he also has vulnerabilities and flaws sure. and struggles with things and needs to be held sometimes. Right. You know, I know. Yeah. So good. Everyone should watch it. It's true. You've had anxiety. You've expressed yeah. uh, struggles with anxiety yep. as yep. well. What? Yeah. Is, how does that manifest yeah. for you? Um. So I, like you, had my first panic attack and thought, "I'm having a heart attack. I'm I, going to die. I'm going to. Die. I'm going to die <laughs> right here." Um. My first panic attack was in high school. Um. And I think part of it was now having the insight that I do all of the women in my life at the time, my mother, my grandmother were all experiencing various levels of mental illness, but no one talked about it. So it was this weird thing of something's wrong, but no one's talking about it. And we're just pretending that everything is okay, which feels really weird and inauthentic. And I guess that's what I'm supposed to do now too. But I was falling apart. Um, I, had my first bout of depression in high school, my first panic attack. And finally, my mom said, you know, do you want to go talk to someone about it? Which was great that that she recognized I needed help. Um, interestingly enough, she said, like, well, you need to go. T- <laughs> you should go talk to someone. I'm like, you should come talk to someone, too. Um but I also think the women of, you know, in my life in that time, it wasn't talked about, you know, like my grandmother, my mother back then, you know, it wasn't something that everyone was kind of talking about. It wasn't, it was still very stigmatized more so than it is now. And I don't know, therapy stuck with me. I've had a couple different therapists. I've been very lucky to have um, two therapists for a very long time. Um, One retired um, in the middle of the pandemic, and I thought, what the hell am I going to do now? And I was very lucky to be able to find someone else that I've been with since. And I am very familiar now with what that kind of rising anxiety feels like. And you start to get sweaty and you can't breathe. And at least now I know what that feels like and can start to, you know, do the breathing or go outside or step away for a minute um, to get back on track. But yeah, I thought, I'm going to die. I'm going to die here, you know, with strangers. And that's going to be it. Like, that's, I'm going to die of a heart attack. Yeah, I've only had, fortunately, I've only had a handful of them, but it's just the most awful. It's the most awful sensation. Yeah, but it... For me, it's helped um, because I can talk about it. It's helped me when students come in and they don't know or they come in saying I'm having a heart attack. And I'm like, actually, you know, this is very typical. It's very normal. And here's, you know, here's what it is. And here's what we can do about it. Um, And I think there's something comforting in someone saying 
me too, you know, that maybe is older and has been through it. And you know, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not crazy. I feel crazy right now. I'm, I feel like I'm the only one that, that this is happening to. And to know that there is a community that you can like openly talk about it, I think makes a big difference. Yeah, that completely mirrors my experience. One of the first things my therapist said was, you're not dry- dying. Right, and right. I was like, oh, wow. Thank God. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Even though it sounds so simplistic, but it does really does just take hearing it. Yeah, yeah. And, and has a huge, uh, a huge impact. And my therapist was like, you probably should cut down on the caffeine. Maybe that would <laughs> help your racing heart too. Right. <laughs> I know. It's a... Uh, yeah, what a, a treacherous thing that those panic attacks, though. Mm-hmm. But speaking of caffeine, you did okay. identify yourself as a dark coffee snob. Yes. Specifically yes. the dark coffee. Yes. So walk me through this thought process. So my friend used to say, um, you take your coffee like your soul, dark and mysterious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which is not true. I don't think I have a dark soul. Um, so I love the smell of coffee. I think it's just this amazing smell. Um, and the darker, the better. And I particularly have a place down, um, on the Cape. There's this bean roaster on Cape Cod. And my favorite place is the Cape. We've been going, uh, since I was two years old to this little rustic cottage in East Ham and the cottage really has never changed. And I wait a full year to get this particular coffee. Um, it's like a tradition when we go, you know, you go over the bridge to the Cape and it's like, now you get to go to your favorite place and have your favorite coffee. So I stop at the Superette, I pick up my bag of coffee in the very first cup on that Sunday morning when I wake up to me is like the perfect day. And so from that point forward, it's like trying to find better coffee than that, knowing you really can't. Yeah, that rules. What I don't know if you want to maybe not bring too much attention to the greatest to the, coffee on Cape Cod, okay. but what so is the, the brewer? the greatest coffee, they're called Beanstalk. Okay. B-E-A-N-S-T-O-C-K. Beanstalk Roasters, and they're in East Ham, Massachusetts. And they have a black tide blackfish creek um is the name black blackfish creek and they also have like a slack tide all of their different brews have different kind of cape coddy names um and you can go to the bean roaster and get like right from them where they're roasting it and to me i'm like i could just i could move right in here right in this little spot i'll just set up my little house right here um Yeah, so it's like the memory tied with the taste. It just becomes like the perfect cup of coffee. Yeah. What is it about the dark roast that that speaks to you? Um, The coffee flavor to me is just so good. So if you can make it like more coffee-y, like the more coffee-y, the better. So that's what the the dark roast to me. And I'm I'm very lucky to have a, a partner who on the weekends he will get the coffee pot ready and then i'm a sleeper i love to sleep in naps to me are like three hours i don't understand this concept of like a 20 minute power nap i don't i don't understand how people can do that so in the morning when i wake up he'll say oh time to go press play that's his little catchphrase and he turns on the coffee pot and that to me is like that's love right there Mm mm-hmm just having someone know that you need your cup of coffee and he like gets up fast and oh, time to press play. And I think everyone should find a partner that that's time to press play. I just simple words that just mean so much. Yes. We have a similar uh, type of, I mean, it's a ritual what you're describing. We right. have a, a yeah. similar thing yeah. on the weekends where I put on a certain kind of music, you know, do the whole thing. Well, I only started drinking coffee. <sighs> I think I was, did I make it through graduate school without coffee? I don't know. It was really late. I know. It was really late. Uh, But now it's just, it's such a a cornerstone of our household in terms of the, uh, Abby's doing a thing right now where she's ordering from the purported best roaster from each state. 
that's cool yeah, that's so, super cool yeah, yeah so we're trying uh, and we're a light roast household which doesn't mean less caffeinated it just it refers to the uh the roasting process right. so yep. you kind of get more of the notes of the bean as opposed to the roasting process right. but yeah it's so uh i mean everybody knows the cultural impact knows everybody's heard of or recognizes the cultural impact of coffee but it is such a such a source of joy mm-hmm. and again mm-hmm. more ritual in terms of we were just, we were away uh this past weekend and so i had to bring our travel set up which has a hand grinder and <laughs> yep. all kinds yeah. of stuff and it's just i don't know there, it's such a joyful yep. thing in addition to the the taste and i grew up in massachusetts so i moved from massachusetts to connecticut in 2003 and growing up in massachusetts it was donkeys right? So it was Dunkin' Ice Coffee. Dunkin' Ice Coffee when it was five degrees or 95 degrees. It was Dunkin' Ice Coffee. And I still have my Dunkin' Ice Coffee. Um, I'm a Dunkin' girl at heart. I haven't got on the Starbucks bandwagon. But yeah, finding like really cool places to hang out. I wrote my dissertation in a coffee shop. It's just something, it's something really cool about the smell and what it means and the rituals around it. Yeah, it's the mood. What a snob. I what know. a snob I am. Eh, just maybe like the good <laughs> stuff, I think. We were also, um, uh, Cape Cod was a big presence sort of mm-hmm. in our like we used to go there regularly on vacation as kids and Abby and I have been a couple of times. Is is East Ham? East Ham? Yep, East is Ham. Is that, yep. what part of the Cape is that? So we're sort of at the elbow of the okay. arm. So um, I never understood like the lower Cape upper cape so we're about right like what what is what does that mean um so we are it's east ham and then wellfleet Truro, and provincetown right so we're out there okay um i always say it's like cape adjacent if you're like right over the bridge so people that have houses and like onset i'm like "Mm, is that truly the cape right sort of cape adjacent so i like to go you know all the way down um and we'll go in the winter we'll you know, go out for a day. Um, lots of places are closed, but you find, you know, the one local, yokel place that's open. Um, and to me, there's just healing properties about the Cape. You know, things haven't changed. The house that we go to hasn't changed. I just feel so lucky to still have the chance to go to that same house. It started off with my grandparents, my mom and I, then it was my mom and I, now it's my husband and I. And, you know, my niece came up when she was like five and she thought the best thing ever was showering outside and like the <laughs> outside shower. And she was like, she thought it was like the best thing. Um, so to be able to share those memories and create, you know, new memories with her is just the best. So I'm counting down the days, counting down the weeks. Yes, we both of our trips were on spring break in March, and so it was dead out there, and that's what we like. <laughs> yeah, you know? I, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's I quiet, think the everything. locals like it too. <laughs> yeah, I bet. But there is something kind of magical about the Cape. I don't know if it's just. I mean, my dad and I are big maps guys, and but the the geography of it and kind mm-hmm. of the I don't know. It's just so iconic, and even though. You can cover a lot of ground on the Cape in mm-hmm. a weekend, you yep. know, because if you stay yep. sort of central, oh yeah, you can go over yeah. here, you can go up here and everything. And our favorite, before I forget, our favorite coffee roaster, I think that we've been to, I don't know if they're a roaster, but it's coffee shop is the Snowy Owl, which yes. has a few yep. locations. In Dennis, I think there's one. I think there's yep. one in Dennis, yep. right? Yep. And that was our first Chemex that we ever had, which is a brewing method. But I think that was one of my favorite cups of coffee that somebody else has ever made for me. Yeah, yeah. So. They and they are they're expanding, so they're in stores now too, which is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, we are also big shark nerds, <laughs> so we love Rob and I love to go kind of shark hunting. So one year for Christmas, um, when you go to the Cape, the lifeguards have the shark flag up, the purple flag that has the shark on it. So I got him his own shark flag, and he ties it to his beach chair so if there's like a shark warning he too will put his shark flag on his beach chair (laughs) um and last year when we were in i think truro um we had our first shark sighting which was you know typical the lifeguards you know the whistles are going off and they're like everyone out of the water and these i will never forget these two little kids 
just turn and they're screaming, screaming like the Jaws movie in there. Like everyone's coming out of the water and, you know, everyone looks terrified. And there's Rob and I with like our cameras, like ready to see like what's going to happen. So and we saw the kind of the flipper, the flip of the tail or whatever. Yeah. Um, and that was like the highlight. Yeah. That's so cool. We spent um, a number of summers on the National Seashore, which mm-hmm. is also just super iconic and powerful. Because if you think about where you are on the map, you know, you've got the whole Atlantic is just, mm-hmm. just out there in the huge. Yeah, uh, and you can pick Bayside or Oceanside. You want waves. You don't want waves. Mm-hmm. You want to be eaten by a shark. You don't want to be eaten by a shark. <laughs> Either <Yes>. side. <laughs> Well, Beck, I can't thank you enough for being on the show today. You may have already mentioned it, so no pressure, but we always try to end with a, a recommendation of some kind, sure. and you've recommended a lot to us today. But is there something yeah. that you'd like to close out the first season of The Flowdown with uh, that you think our listeners should check out? I would say definitely check out, as I mentioned, High Hopes. Um, my favorite podcast right now that I'm listening to, I listen to a lot of murder podcasts, which serial, obviously, lots of people listen to that. But um, we can do hard things is my new favorite podcast. Um, in particular, I think a lot of um, female identifying listeners may like it. Um, it's with Abby Wambach, who, as we know, is a major um, Olympian and soccer player. And she's married to um, Glennon Doyle and Glennon's sister, Abby, is on it. So it's this kind of triad of podcasters. And they just talk about things that are everyday occurrences. So fear. Um, The one I recently listened to was on fun. When did we stop having fun as adults? And what is fun? And do we have the right to have fun when we're, you know, in this crazy world? And what does that look like? So I would say check out We Can Do Hard Things. Um, It's a great podcast. Um, And Glennon Doyle also... um, is a great writer. She's written a couple self-help books. Um, and to me, it is my Tuesday and Thursday. I look forward to this podcast. So that's what I listen to. They put out two episodes a week and they have this, they had a speaker on the podcast who talks about kind of finding beautiful little things in life. And my best friend and I have this ritual now where we have to find one thing every day that is like a happy, beautiful thing. And then we have to text each other what that thing is. And it's like the little glimmer of your day. And it could be something as I got to work on time or they got my order at Duncan, right? Or it could be, um, you know, I had a funny incident with a student the other day that I texted her about that just made me laugh. And, it's that one thing a day that you can focus on. So I would offer that podcast and I would also offer find that glimmer and be accountable to yourself and share it with someone else because I think we all need a little glimmer in our day. Definitely. Multiple recommendations for the price of one. Becca, thank you so much for the thank work that you. you do. And thank you very much for your time and being here today. Thank you really so much for it. having me. I had such a good time. I'm so glad. It was great to talk to you. And thank you, everybody, very much for listening. That concludes season one of The Flowdown. So we will be on summer break. We'll see you again in September 2024. Uh, if you enjoy the show, please do tell somebody else to listen to it. That helps us a lot. Until then, thank you very much. <laughs> We did it. We did it. <laughs> we can do hard things. I know. We sure can. Woo-hoo.